Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, we're here for another PRI uh, Young Leaders Circle uh, Speakers Corner. And so this is an ongoing series where we talk to young professionals in uh, government, think tanks, um, public policy, emerging industries, um, talking to them, you know, how they got started and what they're doing or um, how they came to the field they're studying or their career and just getting to know more folks that are, um, you know, free market focused and interested in the same ideas as PRI. So today we have a, a really special guest. I'm, I'm really excited to have him on and um, he'll kind of tell you this incredible backstory and, and what he does now. But um, we have Jorge Garcia with us. Jorge, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you, Evan. Thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity. Yeah, no, so let's, let's go right in. Maybe, maybe right now, tell us um, where you're at and what you're doing, and then we can get, we can get to the really interesting part of uh, your backstory. All right, so, uh, well, you already said my name. My name is Jorge Galicia, and uh, I am from Venezuela, and what I'm currently doing here in America is uh, I'm uh, um, doing, uh, basically, giving presentations around the states about how socialism devastated my homeland Venezuela because uh, I just left us that place two years ago and I have a lot of uh, interesting stories to, to share with the American audience that uh, fortunately they, they don't have lived uh, such things so mm -hmm. I, I think uh, stories like mine can uh, have an impact in the current uh, uh, discussion that we're yeah, you're having in, in, in this current in this country right now. And you're, you've been traveling at where, you know, I'm connected with you on Facebook. I mean, you're, you're literally traveling the country. Um, I thought I saw you did upwards of 50 speeches this year, or last year, maybe more. Yeah, we, the, the program is being uh, conducted by two. I mean, two, two speakers, one is me, of course, and the other one is another friend of mine whose name is uh, Andres Guilarte. And both of us have uh, spoken in front of, of uh, to at least uh, 50 college campuses across the states. In my case, I have been to places like uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Michigan, Minnesota, California, Colorado, uh, Oklahoma, Kansas. I've been to a lot of places, more than 15 states uh, for me wow. in my case. And it has been a really wonderful experience. Uh, I have, I have uh, get to know uh, a lot of the American culture, and 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 I have, I have, I I, have, I had the chance to exp to interact with a lot of students in different places and different locations. So it has been really unique and wonderful. On a on a side note, I'm jealous because I haven't even been to that many states. So you def you definitely have me beat on traveling the country already. So oh yeah, <laughs> well I didn't expect to do something like this when I arrived. Honestly, this is like wow. <laughs> yeah, well let let's get into um we'll jump to the college stuff in a second, but let's go back to you know take us through maybe before you got here, what you're doing in Venezuela um, and, and kind of walk us through up to your arrival to the United States. Okay. So uh, I, um, I came to the United States in the year 2018. And before that, uh, you know, I, I graduated from law school in Venezuela, in Caracas, Venezuela. And during my time in law school, I, uh, I basically was uh, an, a political activist in Venezuela rooting for freedom, rooting for uh, democracy, because uh, people need to know that in Venezuela, we currently have a socialist dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, since the year 2014, I at least I joined uh, the democratic cause and, and, and I joined the, the student movement of my university. And I also joined a, a political party, a classical liberal political party in Venezuela. And, uh, well, that's basically the reason why I'm here today, because uh, in the year 2017, sadly, one of my best friends uh, was uh, captured by the political police in Venezuela because of the activism we were doing. And uh, that situation put me in high danger as well, because both of us were doing exactly the same things at exactly the same time and location. So, sorry, I needed to... Uh, basically disappear and uh, I needed to uh, stay going to hiding for a long period of time. I was sent into a religious place. I spent uh, in this place like three months, totally isolated, no, no cell phone, no internet connection, no, no, in, no communication of any kind with the exterior, with, uh, with, uh, with anybody outside that place. So it was a really life, a life changing experience for me. And, uh, once my friends, my friend was released from prison, I was able to 
little by little resume a little bit of my uh, ordinary life in Venezuela, but I never got to be the same. So I decided to uh, escape the next year once I finished my law degree in Venezuela. And, and now I'm here in America claiming asylum. So that's a little bit of my, uh, of my story and of, of why I'm here. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, you, you had started, you know, I think most Americans know the recent events with um, Venezuela and the U.S. weighing in on the elections and who's legitimate, who's really the leader there. I mean, you had, you had started several years before. Were, did things, were things always like that when you had started your activism or did things slowly ramp up? Well, uh, I can tell you um, uh, and personally, um, um, let me talk to you a little bit about my, my economics. As, uh, sure. uh, my, uh, you know, I came from a middle class family. Uh, I think most of my childhood and pretty much uh, majority of the time of my when I was a teenager, um, you know, we had a pretty decent life in Venezuela. I mean, we used to go to restaurants. I used to have great birthday parties when I was a child. Um, my family and I used to be really close together. I mean, it was a, it was a great time in my life. Mm -hmm. But then uh, when, I, uh, when I graduated from high school and when I uh, entered, um, you know, when I began my, my, my law degree, everything changed like so dramatically. This is like in the year 2013, 2014. Those years were like the, the, when the actual chaos started in my, at least in my life. Uh, for example, in my house, we stopped having like water supply. We stopped having electricity most of the time. Uh, internet connection started to fail basically every single week. And, uh, you know, even, even food is really hard, was really hard to come by in Venezuela. We knew it, we, in those years, uh, 2014, 2015, we needed to do like really long lines in order to get uh, some pieces of bread or, or, or meat. Or, and the prices were like extremely high for us to afford uh, a, good, a good nutrition. I mean, our, our lifestyle style changed like, completely in a level that we never expected that could, could ever happen to us and that when that happened when I saw that transition in my life I decided to join the political um, movement because I, I well I knew that the country was heading in a wrong direction and I and I wanted to be part of the change right yeah and uh, of course uh, those years well we we were doing a lot of pressures in the in pressure in the street by uh, you know protesting peacefully, but unfortunately, or unfortunately, it didn't have any real effect on on, on, on trying to change the, the power now, right? And, uh, and and now that everything we're seeing with Juan Guaido and the interim president, the, the presidency that is being like, um, you know, uh, how do I say it? Like uh, it's being. Uh, contested by two uh, different persons that that was after I left okay uh yeah so I I didn't I, I I didn't have a lot to do with that but um but yeah that's that's kind of my 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 background and that's why I joined the political movement in Venezuela no that, I mean that's that's fascinating I'm, I'm sure for most I would think most of our viewers and and folks who somewhat know uh, foreign politics um foreign affairs you know, they probably started pay, paying attention the last couple of years, but even before that, um, oh, yeah. I, I was curious, obviously the warning signs were there. Let, let's talk about, so you're here in the U.S., you're going, you're going to campuses now, you're speaking regularly, you're talking about the warning signs you saw. What, what are maybe one or two big themes or a couple reoccurring points you've noticed when, you've, when you spoke this year or even last year? Um, what, are you, what are you telling crowds? Well, I think the, the biggest uh, similarity I see between Venezuela and, uh, and America right now, I think, is the, uh, the inability, if that, if that is, a, is that a word? You know, like, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, the inability that you have here and we also had in Venezuela of control, the levels of spending. Sure. I mean, yeah, you, people need to understand that the first major step that Venezuela gave into socialism didn't didn't even happen uh, under Hugo Chavez, but it happened when we were a democracy in 19, in the year 1975, when we decided to nationalize the oil industry. That first major step started a process of increases, increasing the, na the national spending 
in a big, in, in a dramatic way every single year because the government started to receive like new resources out of nowhere. And uh, in that year also, we had a huge boom among the oil prices. So mm -hmm. the government was received a, a, a whole new quantity of, of resources and they decided to spend and spend it on creating like social programs, subsidies and all kinds of, 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 of services provided by the state. You know, a big welfare state was created in Venezuela during those, this, this year. But then uh, in the year 1978, this huge boom that we saw with the oil prices came to an end. And that's when our problems actually started to, to appear. Like uh, we had like big levels of inflation for the very first time in the 80s because uh, the politicians were not able to cut many of the things that all of the social programs and subsidies that were created during, during this first uh, five years. And then, uh, you know, the only way to maintain those with, uh, without the huge oil revenue was through printing new money, raising taxes, borrowing new money. So this created like a, a really bad economic environment. And, 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 and little by little, you know, this, the Venezuelan society became poorer and poorer. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, you have to understand that Venezuela before this, we used to be the fourth biggest economy of the entire, country, of the entire world. We used to be the we used to have the greater, greatest uh, GDP in the entire Latin American region. We used to be uh, have a better economy than places like China, like Israel, like Spain, Greece. I mean, Venezuela was doing really well, and then uh, because of these uh, bad economic decisions, we ended up having a lot of problems, and we created basically the the perfect environment for someone like Hugo Chavez to appear and he he said that he was going to avenge everybody and he was going to uh, create much more social programs and, and stuff like that so we ended up voting for a radical socialist and now we're paying the consequences of that but it, it didn't start because of authoritarian socialism like people on the left wants to want us yeah. want people to believe here it yeah. started by democratic socialism back, way back in the 70s that's how when our problems actually started to to be no uh, visible and are there any progressive policies that uh, in the united states that you're seeing that remind you i think you know pri we talk a lot about um single payer health care medicare for all yeah. um many of the other uh, progressive policies green new deal are there any ones that you see whether it's those or or another one that you're like gosh that reminds me of the way venezuela went or gosh that reminds me of a policy there yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, all of those, all of these promises of uh, free college education for everybody, for example, that what that was a huge one that we had in Venezuela during the seventies, and and um, uh, also the 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 the, the health care. The government during this time created more than twenty public health care public uh, hospitals where any Venezuelan could go, regardless of its uh, social economics. Like you could be poor, you could be rich, it didn't matter. All you needed to do was go to one of these facilities and there you would receive uh, free medical attention and free medical health care. And all, all of that sounded really well for this, for society, but the problem is it, you know, it was not just not sustainable in the long term for us. And it ended up creating a culture of dependency of, of people like around these services, because not a lot of people knew after this, how to be productive without uh, these kind of services uh, provided by the state. And later, when the when we when the government realized that it was no longer possible for for the for the government to keep financing these programs, well, it was already too late because society was already used to it. Yeah. So um, that that's the danger. I mean, uh, I I think all of these programs sound really really great, but who's gonna pay for it, right? And, and for how for how long can you afford to have these kind of programs before a crisis hit? Then that's what it, what we didn't understand. This understand that in Venezuela yeah. uh, on time. I'm, I'm curious. So when you've been speaking in the U S we can go back to your, uh, your college visits, I guess it, maybe when you've spoken to other college students or younger crowd, um, you know, we know from polling Medicare for all, some other progressive policies are actually well liked by, mm -hmm. um, by a lot of polls F folks approve of them. You know, it's sometimes 50, 60%. When you've gone and done your talks at colleges, when you're talking more to college students, younger folks, do you find that there is maybe more of an acceptance of more progressive policies or they're more open compared to, or is it everyone's like, no, this is terrible. We can't, we can't do it. Like, uh, 
I mean, can you repeat the question? Like, are they open to my talk or? Um, no, more, more the, the, like a, a green new deal or a, a progressive policy that leans more toward um, something a little more socialist. Have you found that folks, when you've done your talk, are they more receptive? Um, folks in the audience, are they more open to those ideas? Yeah, generally when I speak, I find, um, I find a lot of reception in my, in the audience. That's, uh, that has been like the, the common okay. uh, experience for me. Sure. I, I, I did have, I, I have found a lot of, uh, you know, like uh, pushbacks from uh, some students in the audience that tried to, to say like, uh, hey, but uh, socialism did work in, um, I don't know, in Norway, for example, or in Sweden or places like this. Sure. But, but I also bring the point that, you know, all of these Nordic places are not, are not really socialist. They are, they are cap free capitalistic nations. And, and sometimes they have uh, more free market oriented policies than we could have here in America sometimes. In, in, yep. So uh, when I make that, that case, well, uh, sometimes they um, yeah, acknowledge that. But, uh, but generally, I, I think the audience has been uh, welcoming, welcoming me. I did have uh, a couple of experience in uh, one, once in uh, University of North Texas, uh, where my flyers were like all uh, vandalized by some oh, really? uh, radical leftist students there. They didn't like my presence there, of course, and they wrote all kind of things in in in, in the uh, in the flyers and also in uh, in, uh, in Indiana, in Marion University. Uh, there, I, I, I was the same experience. Some people, um, you know, destroyed the, the the flyers and the promotion to the event, but at the end, they didn't show up and they didn't hear what I had to say. So sure. there was no chance, to, like, to have some sort of debate or some stuff. But yeah. so far, thanks to God, the, the public has been really receptive and, and respectful. And I think that when they hear all the things that I've been through, uh, that, that creates, uh, I don't know, I, I, some sort of respect among, uh, in between them, I yeah. guess. No, I mean, I mean, even if they disagree, having, having the debate is... Uh, yeah, hopefully, exactly. Hopefully a respectful debate is, is the key and the most important. And, um, That's right. Well... I'm going to put you on the spot. What's the best in the worst place that you've, uh, we'll go with spoke at, and then I'll ask you another one. Like the best place where I have, uh, spoken. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe the nicest or it was the reception you got or the people or. I mean, that's an interesting, that's really interesting because I think every place is different. Sure. Like, uh, every place I have, uh, uh, you know, kind of, for example, I, I, I spoke at, uh, uh, I, I, oh, Josh, uh, this was in Mississippi in, um, uh, let me remind the name, um, Mills, Mill, Millsaps, Millsaps College. Okay. And uh, there it was extremely interesting because um, I, among the audience was a, a family, a Venezuelan family. Oh. And, uh, you know, I gave my speech and after I, I spoke, uh, after I spoke and I finished uh, my, my presentation, one of the members of this family, you know, she stand up and she started to, to say her own, um, uh, you know, personal story with, with socialism. So basically she confirmed everything I was telling and she started crying because, you know, she needed to left Venezuela in a horrible way, like walking through the border oh, with all of her uh you know her the, her luggage and then his and her family walking as well i mean it was something really really impactful and then and, and when people ha having the chance of, of 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 i mean the student had the chance to hear me and also hear the confirmation of someone else who, who happened to be there who confirmed everything and and, yeah. and 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 you know i i think that was a really beautiful moment to experience absolutely and and uh, and yeah, but I have also spoken on, on other places like um, uh, at Regan Center in, in Santa Barbara. That's I love that place. Like, uh, I mean, for me, it was a honor to be speaking in a place with so, with so much history and where, you know, I, I mean, I love uh, Ronald Reagan and all he did for America and the world. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's having the chance of speak of, of of speaking in a place like this was like unique for me. But every place has like a different uh, 
story to tell and 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 and, then, and I have always I always do like connections and friends in every place I go and I always stay in touch with the people I I meet so yeah. I think it has been a, a wonderful experience for me. Well, that's good. That I mean that's that's a good approach to have I guess is uh, find find enjoyment wherever you go and um, PRI has a lot of former. I guess I'm dating them, uh, Reagan alumni from the administration. So they'll oh, be, wow. they'll be happy to hear that, that, that you, yeah, actually like I, many others week like I, I spoke at, 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 at Rancho del Cielo itself, like at okay. the house itself. Yeah. To a, this was not like a twist in front of students, but uh, it was like a group of, uh, of uh, members of, uh, of, the, of a club, the Lincoln club okay. in Orange County. Yeah. They had like a retreat there and they invited me to as a, as a speaker so it was like a wonderful opportunity for me to speak at the rancho itself it was like wow (laughs) no (laughs) never expect yeah so let's go a little let's say there's someone um you know maybe they're in the u.s maybe there's someone else either they want to be an activist or they want to start speaking um what what advice would you give them what you know input feedback based on your journey well, for me, it was all about the network, you know, the networking. I uh, honestly, I never, I never expected I was going to be doing stuff like this when I arrived to the U.S. But because of the connections I had in Venezuela, you know, I was part of an organization named Students for Liberty, sure. And uh, I did a lot of friends there. I did a lot of connections because of the of the activism that I was doing with them. And basically, that was the reason that I got connected with the Fund for American Studies in the first place, and they reached to me and they say, hey, we're, we want to do this project. Uh, we were looking for some Venezuelan guy to start uh, sharing your, uh, his story and telling American audiences about Venezuela and how Venezuela became uh, such a horrible place uh, and, and how did it transform from being a wonderful country to being what it is today, right? And, 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 and you know, that I never expected that to happen, but I think... I, I, I'm going to say that this was because of networking, you know, I, you, yeah. people that really want to do the activism and want to and have a nice story to tell. I think the first step is to get involved with political organizations, with think tanks and, you know, talk to people and, you know, at any moment, someone will find your story interesting and you're going to have a chance to, to speak, to give an interview, maybe to, to speak in front of somebody. I mean, that, that's what it takes. I, 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 that's what it took for me, in my opinion, because, yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's, that's great advice. Um, I think that, that echoes in so many um, lines of, of work and different industries of, of your network and just, yeah. just being willing to meet people, uh, really exactly. talk to them. So that's great. Well, I'll give you uh, the last word and, and parting thoughts if, if you'd like to go. Well, as I always say, um, my I'm gonna give like a little advice for the audience. Uh, people, I think people really need to care about the levels of spending here in America because I see how the deficit levels are increment are increasing every single year, regardless of which party is in, is in control of the federal government. We see how the presidency and the Congress keep flipping between Republicans and Democrats, and apparently that doesn't even matter anymore because the deficit just keeps growing and growing and growing. Yep. And eventually, I believe that if you don't control if this and if you don't find a, a way to, ba- to balance the budget, you will see yourself in a really bad economic situation. And who knows? You know, in Venezuela, one of the... F- uh, main reasons that we got into Hugo Chavez was because we were unable to control the levels of spending on time. This created a horrible crisis, economic crisis, and people wanted someone to to fix that, and they choose the worst, uh, you know, candidate possible. So I don't want to see something like that happening here. And uh, of course, that's the worst scenario. I don't. I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen here. I mean. But you could have uh, other scenarios like Argentina, like Greece. I mean, history is full of examples of societies that collapse or because they just were not able to control their levels of spending on time. So that's my main message right now, what I'm trying to give to, to the audiences, like care about the spending. And, and, and I think the Republican leadership needs to hear this because I think fiscal responsibility is somehow being left a part of the agenda. I, don't, I, I didn't even hear it a lot at the RNC convention. So... Uh, that, that's worrisome especially this year with uh you know the stimulus yeah, checks exactly well, uh it was a lot of money that was mm-hmm. uh, in the fed yeah. so no that that that's great advice so 
Well, Jorge, thank you for being here. It was, it was wonderful hearing from you, your story. Um, you know, I, I think like when I said, when I reached out to you, when we first talked last year, um, I mean, I was just blown away. Like we were kind of, we were networking and I started talking to you and I was like, um, yeah, it's, it's a great story. And I think the fact that you can share it, um, and folks can hear firsthand, you know, coming from Venezuela, I think we all hope it goes back to, you know, a democratic society where, you know, you and folks that have had to leave can go home. So uh, yeah, that's, that's you. my dream to go back eventually. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks again for being here. We, uh, we're yeah, here. thank you, Evan. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye.